Here's what I personally think. I think when we chase after God and he allows us to catch him, I think there's a question he asks. There's something he wants to know from us. Clearly he knows everything about everything, but he wants to see the answer to this question lived out. Here's the question. I think God says, once I let you catch me, Preston, what will be your response? Once I let you find me, how will you respond? I think, personally, there's only one really good answer to this question. There's a lot of things we can do, but I think it all falls into one intimate scriptural bucket. Two weeks ago, we started a series entitled The Seven Mandates, where I'm going to be walking through what I and the elders feel God has given us, not as requests or even desires, but as mandates for us as a church. And I know that's a really strong word. And two weeks ago, when I kicked this uh, series off, uh, I, I told you mandate number one is more important than all the other mandates. They're all important, but the first is exponentially more important than all the others. And if we don't get the first mandate right, we might as well not even endeavor to go after the, the next six. Mandate number one is that we're to be a presence-driven church. And what that means is not just that we would be all about God's presence when we gather here together corporately. It means that we would be a people of his presence. We talked about the fact, one of the most brilliant things I believe Moses said and we heard God say, but Moses says to God, what sets your people apart from all other people on the earth is your presence. That was true then, it's true now. And I, I gave you three of the first six steps to, in my opinion, experience. It's a path, it's not a formula, to help us all experience more of the tangible presence of God in our everyday lives. How many of us would like to experience a little bit more of the tangible presence of God today? Not just in our lives, today. Okay, good. Good, because if you didn't raise your hand, you're not gonna enjoy the rest of this service, all right? We're gonna jump right into to the fourth of six steps. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Luke chapter 18. You can put a marker in John chapter 12. Step three takes a much more serious turn, steps three and four are essential and difficult. Remember the first three steps, step one was prioritize. If we're gonna be a people of God's presence, if you're gonna experience more of God's tangible presence, it must be a priority. The second step is to acknowledge. And we talked about the fact that how many times do we walk into a room and the first thing we do is not in our hearts just to say, Oh my word, you are here. I believe with all of my heart we would experience more consistently the tangible presence of God if we were better at acknowledging the everywhere all the time presence of God. And then we stepped into step three, which was to revere, to walk in the fear of the Lord, to live at all times in awe of God, not the meh of man. I either walk in the awe of God or the meh of man. And I will not experience the tangible presence of God consistently when I am walking in the meh of me and not the awe of him. And that brings us to step number four. Step four, you might not like but I'm convinced God does. Step four is repent. A word we don't hear used a lot. And listen, if I were the enemy, I would try and get the church not to use this word because I like when she's separated, when there's distance relationally between her, the bride of Christ, and God. I've taught a lot on repentance and so I'm not gonna go you know, in, down the same inroads that I typically go. But if you don't know what the word repent means, here's a definition. Repentance refers to an event in which an individual receives a divinely provided new understanding of their behavior, a new way to see 
what they were doing which was wrong and feels compelled to change that behavior and walk in a new direction with and towards God. Now, I want to speak to two specific types of people as it relates to repentance, all right? In my opinion, there are two types of people who typically do not consistently repent. Here's the first of the two types of people. They say this right here. Well, I haven't really done anything bad in a while. Now, in every service, there was a little bit of a laugh and snicker. And here's why there's a laugh and snicker. Because honestly, what we're saying is, I can't believe people would ever talk like that. When actually, we all have. And let me gently prove it to you. When was the last time you had a thousand day run with the Lord where you repented every day? Me. We kind of laugh and snicker, but really, we're just acknowledging I'm self-righteous too. When we have the thought, well, I just didn't do anything bad. Let me help you understand. Sin is not just wrongdoing. Sin is actually also the absence of what I'll call right doing or doing right. Acts chapter 10. Remember what it says about Jesus. Jesus didn't just go around healing people. What else did he do? He went around doing good. If you think I'm making this up, that sin is not just wrongdoing, but it's also when I do not do right. Let me show you. I didn't make this up. It's James chapter 4, verse 17. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him or her, it is sin. Repentance isn't just saying, God, I'm sorry I did something so bad. Please forgive me. I'm going to turn in the opposite direction. Repentance is also, God, I knew you were asking me to forgive that person. And in my flesh, I just didn't want to. And I'm sorry I didn't do the right thing. How often does God hear us talk like that when we're alone in his presence? That's a life of repentance. Now, I want to show you a moment in scripture that kind of draws a picture of all of us when we're living in a self-righteous state of existence. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, O God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, notice, this is the human condition. We categorize or tear sin. You know why we do it? It's a way we deflect. Well, what they did is worse than what I did. So I'm not as bad as them, which therefore means I'm good and they're not. It's what the Pharisee was doing. He says, I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. Listen to what Jesus says. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. Now, I don't have the time to camp here, but if you go read Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it connects justification from God and being justified before God with having or experiencing peace with God. I'll personalize it the way I want you to. I believe what the Lord's helping us understand, Jesus is helping us understand. Preston, when you don't repent, you're like the Pharisee, not like the tax collector. And as you leave, let's just say church, I want you to know, when you're like the Pharisee, there's something off between you and me. You're not experiencing the fullness of relational peace between you and myself. But when you're like the tax collector, understanding your need from me, for me, that distance is always closed. The gap is always closed. The first type of people, person who 
just kind of doesn't repent very often. This is the one who says, eh, I just don't do bad very often. But remember this, the absence of repentance comes from the presence of self-righteousness. And when a person is self-righteous, they are most certainly not experiencing the presence of the one, the only one, who alone is righteous. The second type of person is totally different. Here's what they say. Well, if I repent and get honest about my wrongdoing, God will get angry and go away. They're literally saying, I don't repent because if I did, God would no longer be present. And so I don't, so he'll stay close. That's actually not how it works. There is actually beauty in repentance. Repentance is actually romantic. Let me show you how and why. Every time we repent, we get a greater revelation of God's love for us. Here it is. Every time I repent of my sin before God, I am giving him reason to run away from me. But he never has, he is not, and he never will. You would think every time I say, I go alone to go into his presence and just start repenting of my sin that he would say, this is disgusting, get me out of here. And yet every time when I welcome him with the humility of repentance and just say, you are God and I am not. And I was reminded time and time again why I'm not. You would think he would run from me, but here's what has happened every time and will happen every time, he draws nearer. But if I were your enemy, I would try and convince you to get hung up on the junk so that you would never bring it before God. Because as long as you don't bring it before the Lord, you are not experiencing the fullness of relational peace between you and him. Repentance is romantic. Isaiah chapter six, I'm not gonna read it to you, but it's one of my favorite moments in the Old Testament, Isaiah has this incredibly holy encounter with God. He says, I saw the Lord. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he had this vision that was where God was so tangibly present. And in the middle of it, out of his mouth and his heart, he cries out before the Lord, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. See, one of the ways I know I am drawing nearer to him is when I sound like that. I don't mean walk around just, I'm terrible. It's not that. It's I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And thank God I have found the one. And so I boldly go into his presence, not in shame from the mistakes I've made or the the good I did not do, which he desired me to do. And so I find repentance romantic because every time I do, he doesn't run, he draws near. So here's what we're gonna do. And if you weren't here two weeks ago, uh, this is an application message. The older I get, the more I'm beginning to see sermons less about man's encounter with man and more about God's encounter with man and man's encounter with God. You'll forget most of what I say. Most of you didn't even remember the first three steps and that's okay. But that's why we're gonna do them all. So I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And you may have never done this before in church. It's okay. Forget about everybody else in this room. The God who created the universe and holds it up by the power of his word is present in this place. Out of all of the places he could be right now, he is here. And one of the biggest reasons he is here right now isn't just that this is his house. He is here because he knew you would be. But have you ever been in a relationship where something was off, where we were covering up wrongdoing, not doing right when we should have, and we just chose not to talk about it and got used to the relational distance? Repentance says, forget that. 
I want to draw nearer to you. So just begin to repent. Ask the Lord, search out my heart, O oh God. Show me the envy. Show me the covetousness. Show me the malice. Show me the anger. Show me the unforgiveness. Begin to move all of that junk out of the way by putting it in his hands, not trying to push it behind you so you can hide it. Let's just spend a couple of moments romantically, intimately repenting before our best friend, the one true God. Jesus, thank you so much for doing what must be done, what had to be done. That would turn repentance from being an excruciating, humiliating, embarrassing, hold your head down in shame exercise to a thing of beauty and intimate fellowship with the Father. God, thank you for not only not running away from us, God, you are the God who came to save us. While we were yet sinners. Holy Spirit, would you point out in all of us the areas in our lives where we do not look like Jesus? Help us look more and more like our co-heir. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood for all of our sin. Father, thank you for receiving us and drawing even nearer to us as we repent and turn towards you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 
Step number five, and it's one of my favorites that I talk about from time to time. Uh, and, and if repentance is no fun for you, step five is a lot of fun. Step five is pursue, all right? And I, I wanna kind of dispel a notion uh, due to what I believe is a lack of understanding around this idea of pursuit. What I pursue reveals most what I desire the most. Whatever I pursue the most reveals what I desire most. If I chase money, it shows it's my number one desire. If I chase possessions, it shows it's my number one desire. If I chase fame, it shows it's my number one desire. If I chase anything, that is my number one desire. And here's what God says. I'll personalize just like I, I want you to. Preston, I alone want to be your number one desire. And I've set it up in such a way where that will be proven in how you pursue me. God's desire as it relates to you isn't just to be loved by you. It is that your love for him would cause you to chase after him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, God goes on record saying, it's impossible for you to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely or diligently Seek him. I've heard this scripture since I was a boy. God will give a reward to those who wholeheartedly, diligently seek after him. Have you ever wondered, what's the reward? Is it a house? Is it another car? Is it a winning lottery ticket? Is it the absence of tribulation? What's the reward God gives to those who diligently seek him? Let me answer the question. The reward he gives is the most valuable thing that ever will be himself. Preston, let me tell you something about me I've never told you before. When you chase after me, there is a response that I give every time when you seek after me with all of your heart. I want you to know the reward and I could give you anything I wanted to give you in response to your chasing after me, but I want you to know this is what I promise to give you every single time. More of me. I will give you myself. Now the question some of you I know we're asking because this is a question I get semi-consistently. Is God playing some kind of divine game of hide and seek? Like, why does God make us chase him? Why can't we just be friends and walk together all the time? Here's part of the answer, because that's not how love works. I learned this early on when I fell in love with the girl who became my wife. Love always inv it involves active pursuit, not passive feelings. The first time I tried to kiss Holly, we were sitting in her car, I was driving, I was dropping her off at the place where she was staying, and I thought, this is the moment, I'm gonna kiss her. And you know how you just, you, 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 like early on in a relationship, you're just not sure how it's going to go, but somebody's got to just make the commitment to, to, to go first, to initiate, you know? So I look over at her. I'm trying to send a message with my eyes, you know, like the rock smolder kind of a vibe. She's not picking up what I'm putting down. And so I'm like, I don't care. I'm going in. And so I lean in and, you know, there's like a threshold like a, there, there's a line where if, if you stop short of that line, you can stop at any point. But once you hit that line of demarcation, you just got to go, just, just finish the deal. I get to here and she smiles real big and starts chuckling. And I'm like, I'm to this spot. I, I must continue on. And so I lean in and I literally kissed her teeth the first time we kissed. <laughs> no joke. She will corroborate this story. I didn't understand what was going on. And my wife is not the type. That girl doesn't have a game playing bone in her body. But I was learning something about love. She, without realizing it, was sending me a message. And 24 hours later, wouldn't you know, the girl initiates a kiss with me. 
The message I received that day was, Preston Love pursues. Will you chase me? I'm going to chase you. Will you chase me? I think this is one of the most amazing questions God will ever, ever ask a human. Aki, will you chase me? Will you spend all the days of your life running after me more than anything else? Why has God set it up in such a way where he wants us to chase after him? Is this a cruel joke? No, it's romantic. Jeremiah 29, verses 13 and 14. God says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. That's a promise. Now watch this next promise. I will, Preston, be found by you. Why does God ask us to seek him? Because one of his favorite things is to be found. Think about it. Just think of the difference between seeing and seeking. He doesn't want us to see him. Think of the genius. In the Old Testament, God says, no man can look upon me and live. So Moses, I've got to hide your face. In part, he's saying, Preston, the goal isn't just to see me. It's so much more robust than that. Think about it. There's a huge difference between trying to see something and seeking after something. Here's the difference. I told you this story before. One time I was in San Francisco in the back of an Uber. We're driving through an intersection. The driver goes, oh, another typical day in San Francisco. I look up to see what he's talking about. There's like a dozen jaybird naked humans protesting with signs. I wasn't trying to see all that nonsense. So when I saw it, I would whoop, whoop. Okay, I saw something I wasn't trying to see. Now let me illustrate the difference between seeing, merely seeing something, and seeking something and finding it. Have you ever lost something valuable at the house before? Ever lost your keys? Ever lost some money? Ever lost your wallet? Yeah. Question. How do you go about trying to find it? Some of us go about it blaming others. Who moved my wallet? Who moved my keys? What did you little thieves do with my money? But truthfully, to the extent to which we value something is the extent to which we go find it. Why does God want to be found by you and not just seen by you? I see things all, the day, all, all day long and just go, but when I seek after something that I really want and I find it, there's always a eureka moment. I have found it. This is what God desires us to experience every day of our lives. Preston, humanity will search after things looking to fill a void only I can fill. And I don't want you just to find this one time in your life. I want you to find it over and over and over and over again so that every day of your life, Preston, there is a moment between the two of us where you have chased after me in such a way and I let you catch me where you in your heart, as it explodes, say, I have found you. Do you know one of my concerns about the bride and the day in which we live? It appears as though she might be getting a little more worldly. You want a decent definition for worldliness? A way of thinking or living which sees sin as normal and righteousness as strange. I want to live in such a way. Forget my keys. Forget when I found that check I thought I lost. Jesus would tell stories and say, let me describe the way the eureka moment feels when you find the Father. It's like finding something valuable in a field and going and selling everything you have just to obtain what you've found. Eureka. I have found the one I've been searching for. And listen to me. Let's, let's apply this to, to human relationship and marriage. One of the reasons marriages fall apart is we stop pursuing one another. 
And yet it's as though we haven't learned that lesson and so we just hope to have intimate fellowship with God while never pursuing him. He's not playing a game. He just wants to give me the gift of, I have found the one I love. There's something overwhelming about seeking and then finding because we rarely celebrate what we see, but we always celebrate what we find, which we were seeking after the most. What does seeking look like? Psalm 63 verse one is a pretty good start. Oh God, you are my God. And here's what that means, Lord. I earnestly search after you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body, being and soul, longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. That's what it feels like. We live in a desert. Imagine going without water for a hundred straight days in the middle of our summer. If I came up to you and handed you an ice glass cold water, how would you receive it? If you could survive that long without water, you would throw a party. This is what God desires. Preston, I want you to live in such a way and treasure me in such a way that every time I walk into the same room you do, you celebrate it. One of his favorite things in all the earth is when you chase after him. And so we're going to do that right now. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? You can get in whatever posture you want. You might want to get on your knees. You might want to lay on your face, prostrate before the Lord. You may want to stand and lift your hands. It doesn't matter. Forget about everybody else in the room. What does chasing look like? And what would it look like if right now in your heart you set a goal before the Lord? I'm going to chase you more than I ever have before. My heart has heard you say, come away and talk with me. And Lord, my heart responds saying, I am coming. Oh God, you are the one we love. In this moment, may this be one of the richest moments in our church's history heretofore. May we chase you in such a way where you walk away from today saying, they've never done that before. Let's take a few moments and do whatever you got to do. Run through the field. Through the briars and the thickets, the scratches and the thorns of a fallen world. Refuse to stop. Wholeheartedly seek him. And right here, right now, you will find him.
What a divine invitation. <laughs> the God who could have anything he wants, anytime he wants, because everything is his in heaven and on earth. That he would ever look in our direction and say, you know the one thing I want right now? Chase me. In love, pursue me. God, may our lives be lived in such a way where we are not just those who follow you, but we are followers who chase after you. You are the God who came to save. You loved us long before we ever loved you. God, may our lives be lived as those who've truly received that revelation. And may the people of this house be friends of God who lovingly, constantly, chase after God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're to step six. It's going to get even more fun right here. Okay? Here's what I personally think. I think when we chase after God and he allows us to catch him, I think there's a question he asks. There's something he wants to know from us. Clearly he knows everything about everything. But he wants to see the answer to this question lived out. Here's the question. I think God says, once I let you catch me, Preston, what will be your response? Once I let you find me, how will you respond? And I think, personally, there's only one really good answer to this question. There's a lot of things we can do, but I think it all falls into one intimate scriptural bucket. It's the word lavish. It's to lavish our love upon him. Preston, what does this word mean? Well, the verb lavish means this, to bestow something in generous measure or extravagant quantities. 
to spend, to expend, to heap, to shower, to pour, to deluge, to give generously, to give unstintingly, to bestow freely. This must be our response. The question you might be asking is, why must we lavish? Here's my answer. I lavish on him in response to all he has lavished on me. I just want to give you three things he has lavished, deluged, poured, poured out in such measure, it's immeasurable upon you. Three things. First, he lavished you with his love. First John 3, 1 John 3.1, how great is the love the Father has lavished, deluged, poured out in immeasurable measure upon us that we should even be called children of God. He lavished you with his love. Second, he lavished you with forgiveness. Remember the story in Luke 7 where the prostitute comes and breaks over perfume over Jesus' feet and anoints him with it. Watch how Jesus responds in this moment and imagine being this woman. Jesus says, I tell you, this woman sins and they are many. Think about being that person for a sec. Everybody in town knows your wrongdoing, right? Small town, everybody knows what you did bad. You come and bring a gift, pour it at Jesus' feet. And then Jesus says, hey, let me let everybody know. Her sins and there are many. He wasn't calling her out. Watch what he says next. While there are many, they have all been forgiven. And so she has shown me much or lavish love. But a person who is forgiven little, another way to say it, probably um, to understand a a touch more theologically is, but for those who think they've been forgiven little, they show only a little love. They do not lavish. Third thing he lavished on you is his grace. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood. Clearly speaking about Jesus. We have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. His unmerited favor. Another way to see grace. When God gives you something you do not deserve. The riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. How do you respond to the lavishness of God? Simple. By lavishing on God. John chapter 12, if you put a marker there, let's read this very powerful story that happens after Jesus arrives back in Bethany. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with this fragrance. I want you just to imagine being Mary in this moment. Not long ago, before this moment in her life, there's another moment where she's falling at Jesus' feet. Do you remember what she was doing? Her brother Lazarus had died and she was blaming Jesus. He died because he didn't make it in time. And she didn't outright blame him, but she did say, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And she's crying at his feet. And soon after that, after she sees Jesus raise her brother from the dead, she finds herself in a room again with Jesus. And I wonder if she wasn't thinking, what does one do? who has been given a greater revelation of the king and who he is, what does one do when they find themselves in the room with him? And she goes and she grabs a bottle, a very expensive bottle, which costs a year's worth of wages. 
The people in the room thought she was crazy. I'm not even sure she realized there were other people in the room other than her king. And she lays this beautifully extravagant, lavish gift at Jesus' feet. The the moment and the lavish gift moved Jesus in such a way where when Matthew tells this story, this moment in human history, Matthew says, then Jesus said, I want you all to know something. What this woman just did in this room at my feet is going to be talked about forever. This lavish gift Mary laid at his feet moved him in such a way where he's still talking about it and will never stop. Unfortunately, there's more than one option that you can choose when you find yourself in the room with the king who has lavished immeasurable blessings upon you. You can respond like Mary, but let's read the next two verses. You can respond like someone else. Verse four, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him said, that perfume is worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. This is such a powerful five verse teaching where Jesus shows us the protocol when the king walks into the room, but also the other option. And here's what we're taught. You can either be the one who refuses to let go of what is valuable or you can be the one who refuses to hold on to what is valuable. What Mary teaches us is that the more you sit at Jesus' feet, and this is how many would describe Mary, that's why it says Martha was working, but Mary, she just wanted to sit at Jesus' feet. Mary teaches us with her life and this moment, the more you sit at his feet, the more you will end up laying at his feet. While this step is a lot of fun, it's also, in my opinion, the most expensive one. Because you can't just bring any old gift to your king who saved you who came running after you, who adores you, who shares his inheritance equally with you. We cannot just lay something at his feet. When I was younger, I used to think that meant you just have to write bigger checks. That's kind of the pinnacle of spiritual maturity is when you're just not afraid to write a bigger check unto the Lord. You know what I've learned? Sometimes the easiest thing to do is to write big checks because there are things he asks for that are far more expensive than money. He says things like, Preston, do you love me? Lord, with all of my heart, you know that I do. Have you received a revelation that I have lavished my love upon you? Oh, Lord, every day I feel it more and more. There's something, a very beautiful and expensive bottle you've been holding on to since you were a boy that I would like you to lay at my feet. Lord, what is it? An empty nest. This bottle has meant so much to you that you even talked about it when you proposed to your wife. Will you lay it at my feet? Here's the question I believe God is asking every single one of us who belong to him. What will you lay at my feet? 
not with hesitation or reservation or frustration, but in love. Everybody in the room probably thought Mary was crazy and Judas was the only one to say it out loud. That is too big a gift to give. You are insane. And I don't even think Mary heard them. She was so captivated by her king that she just said, this, value, this very valuable bottle is worth too much to be used on me. He alone deserves to receive this gift. And so I pour it out on his feet. What would our lives be like if every day we endeavored to lay something lavish at his feet? We must. And so, right now, we will. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Once I let you catch me, how will you respond? What I love about Mary in this moment, she didn't give a rip about anybody else being in the room because she was in the room with the one. And the many didn't even hit her radar. I've been praying for several weeks that this moment in each of our services, something would happen in each of our hearts where just like Mary, we lay something so lavish at his feet that the aroma fills the entire valley. And they don't need to know where the smell is coming from, they just need to know the why behind the smell. Forget about everybody else. Yeah, maybe you wanna to come to the altar, maybe you wanna lay on your face before the Lord, maybe you wanna stand in holy awe. Whatever lavish looks like, Don't worry about how it's interpreted. Fixate on his face as he receives the gift he will talk about forever. Let us all lay something lavish at his feet.
forever I will sing of all you've done I will lay my whole life down for you Jesus I will give it all God, I thought when I got to the end of part two, I would be saying, God, would you show us more of yourself? <laughs> but Lord, our hearts cry out, not just for more of you. I find my heart crying out that you would get more of me. Have all of us, oh God. God, I never want to spend more time talking about what's going on in a fallen world than I do spending time talking about the one who reigns above it all. God, may the aroma from our hearts move down every street in this valley. We don't want you to draw them to us. We want you to draw them to yourself. God, thank you for letting us catch you, for promising to be found by us. Spirit of the living God, would you help us to daily sit at the feet of our king and before we get up every time may we lay something lavish at his feet God may it be so lavish this gift of our hearts from our hearts that our children's children's children watch no matter what age This is how we live in the family of God. He first loved us, 
and we endeavor to respond every day of our lives lavishing our love back. Thank you, God, for being with us today, for being with us every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.